You can go ahead and grab a seat. Well, hey, everybody, good morning to you. Happy Sunday to you. Thanks for being here on this uh, first Sunday of October. Today, I'd love for you, if you have a Bible in one way, shape, or form, uh, to open it up to the book of Romans in the Bible, the fifth chapter. And we'll get to that in a second. But we're in this series that gets to the core of who a Christian is, a follower of Jesus. Like, it's the core of what a Christian thinks and believes and feels and does. And what we want to focus on today has to do with love. You know, uh, people have always hungered for love. It's part of the human condition. It's just how we're made. I remember one time my parents were uh, sitting around their living room, and they almost always had a dog as part of our family. And uh, at this point in time, they had a little miniature dachshund, a little wiener dog, you know, those, those funny little, uh, you know, they're short-legged, long dogs, and they're just a lot of fun. They're hilarious little dogs. And my dad especially would just sort of dote on that dog. I mean, he just loved that dog, and that dog loved him. Like when he'd come through the door, that dog would go nuts. It'd be all excited and fired up. And uh, my dad would be just as excited and fired up to see that dog each and every time he came in. He would reach down, he'd scoop that little dog up, and it would wiggle around, you know, his neck, and it would whimper just a little bit, and it'd be licking him all over the, his face and everything. And he would reciprocate in kind, like he would talk to that dog, you know, and, and kind of whimper himself toward that dog, and he would kiss it on the, the head and the snout and all that kind of stuff, and they'd just have like a little moment every time he came in the door. Well, on this particular occasion, my parents are sitting in their living room on the couch, and my dad, he has that little miniature dachshund dog in his lap. It's lying on his back, and it's looking up at my dad, you know, it's just like this. And they're uh, kind of looking, staring at each other, and my dad was saying to that little uh, wiener dog, he was saying, out of all the dogs in the world. I chose you. And that dog's just mesmerized, you know. <laughs> it's like they're staring into each other's souls or something, you know. Which is when we overheard my mom say, if either of them loved me half as much as they loved each other, <laughs> will I be a happy woman? <laughs> People have always hungered for love. People everywhere hunger for love. It's part of the human condition. It's why the Hallmark Channel has such a strong following, you know? <laughs> but when Jesus came, he brought with him a profound love that was quite unique, that the world really hadn't known before. And I want us to be super clear on the love that he offered in order to make it a sort of foundational baseline for your life, for it to sink deep into the core of, of who you are. And listen, there are two ways to approach love, like two kinds of love for us to, to think about here today. The first kind of love is a love that seeks value in what is loved. Like a professor by the name of Ian Pitt Watson, he was a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary, and he talked about, and you understand this, he talked about how we often love objects or people because they are lovable or lovely or worthy or of our love in some way. He says, you know, we, we love people of great beauty or great intelligence, like we love great leaders or we, we love gifted athletes or we love talented performers. That's a kind of love that seeks value in what is loved. Now, we're most used to that type of love, and we understand what it looks like for someone or something of great worth to, to be attracted to that. Again, it's a love that celebrates the beauty or strength of the beloved. You know, where an object, you know, is, is loved because it's expensive or attractive or it lends status to the one that's associated with it. And the Greeks had a ready word for this kind of love. It was the word eros. 
eros. And when we hear that word, you may have heard that word before, we tend to think of the word erotic, but eros was much more than just some sort of sensual, sexual love. At its core, eros described that kind of love that I give to what satisfies my desire or wins my admiration or fulfills my appetites. Like, think of it this way. Eros is love on a treasure hunt. And eros, that, that love that grows out of need and admiration and desire, is not necessarily a bad kind of love in and of itself. But eros alone, like, like by itself, it's just too fickle and precarious a love to build your life on. You'll be trapped in an unwinnable contest to constantly prove that you're pretty enough or smart enough or strong enough or capable enough or even spiritual enough to deserve loving. No, what we all need is a love made of sterner stuff than arrows, which brings us to another kind of love. Like, so there's a love that seeks that which is valuable in what is loved, but there's also a love that creates value in what is loved. There's a love that fastens itself onto something or someone, makes that someone or something precious and valued beyond calculation. And that kind of love, well, it sort of defies reason. And here's the best way I know how to think about this. I'd say every family understands this. Like if you have kids, you understand this, or maybe you've experienced this before in your life. Like in practically every family, a kid will have some sort of object that carries immense value and worth. Not necessarily a, an expensive object. Most often it's not. But it's an object that comes to hold great, almost incalculable worth. For instance, with my family, uh, my wife Melanie and I, we have three kids. And when they were younger, when they were growing up, when they were really little, all of them had something, some object that they loved with an incredible, intense love. Like my son Joshua, he had this thing that was sort of a, it was like a cross between a bear and a blanket. I actually brought it here with me today. Again, it was a cross between a bear. So it had like a bear head and bear arms, but then it was a blanket, you know, the rest of the way down. And this was called Lovey Bear. But he couldn't really say that full out, so he would call it Wubby Bear. <laughs> and he would say, Wubby is my very special bear, you know? <laughs> and wherever Joshua went, Wubby went, you know? When Joshua ate, Wubby was there. When Joshua went outside, Wubby went outside with him. When Joshua went to sleep, Wubby was right there sleeping with him. Or it, I actually have a picture when he was a little kid. Sometimes Wubby was underneath him, you know, right there. That's a good day. Like the shoe hanging off there. Like, yeah, that's a good day. That's a good rest right there. But everywhere Joshua went, Wubby went with him, you know. Wubby was his very special bear. And you can imagine over time... I mean, Wubby ended up looking a little ratty, a little nasty, a little dirty, you know. Sometimes when he'd get real crusty, we'd throw Wubby in the uh, washing machine to give him a little Wubby bath, you know, <laughs> wash some of the grime off of him. But it didn't matter one way or the other because Joshua loved him. Joshua loved his Wubby bear. You know, he loved Wubby with an intense affection, even when Wubby was pretty worn out. Like you love Joshua? You love his wubby bear. They're a package deal. The nature of Joshua's love is what made wubby so valuable. And my other kids had their objects as well. My son Daniel, my oldest son, he had a yellow blanket, a sort of crocheted yellow blanket here. It was appropriately called yellow blankie, you know. <laughs> And over time, it got so tattered and worn out that it has a lot of strings that kind of hang off there. And what Daniel would do is, you know, he'd settle in somewhere and he would suck his fingers and then he would take this and he would rub it next to his nose, but he would take these strands and he would just rub it against his nose. And sometimes, you know, we catch him maybe shoved up his nose or something, you know, it's kind of nasty. 
My daughter, my daughter had this little uh, yellow duck, all right? And she got this little yellow stuffed animal duck when we were in Boston. We were going up to Boston where my father-in-law uh, was really originally from. We went up there one Father's Day, and uh, we, we were touring around, looking at all, doing all the Boston stuff. And we did one of those duck boat tours. I don't know if you've ever seen those before. Uh, and while we were in uh, Boston, we had visited Boston's north end, and we saw the church where all that one if by land, two if by sea took place there, and the old north, north church in Boston's uh, north end. So naturally, naturally, Elise named her little yellow stuffed animal duck Paul Revere. <laughs> I'd like for you all to meet Paul Revere, or as they said in Boston, Paul Revere, you know? And my kids, like, they treasured these uh, objects, blankets, the bears, the duck. They treasured them with a, an intense love and affection. And at times, they couldn't be without them. And when Wubby or Yellow Blanky or Paul Revere were young and new and clean and pristine, my kids loved them. But when they were old and ragged and, and a little dirty, my kids loved them still, probably loved them more. They didn't love these things because they were beautiful, you understand. They loved them with a kind of love that made them beautiful. You get this. I mean, you know, my wife, Melanie, she had a, a Polly bear. I should have it here, too. By the time I'd met Polly, this is what Polly looked like. <laughs> I know. I know. That's a worn-out bear right there, you know. No eyes on that thing. Its nose is going this way. This leg, something's happening with that leg. <laughs> you know, it's all matted. I had an old uh, crusty blanket, or excuse me, a pillow that uh, I still have to this day. An old feather pillow that my mother gave me since as long as I can remember. And I kid you not, I would run into a burning building to rescue that pillow. It means that much to me. I'm not kidding. You look at my pillow because it's, it's old and, and pretty ratty. You'd think that thing is gross, but not me. In fact, when Melanie and I first got married, uh, she would crawl into bed and she would take my pillow and she would throw it off the bed. This is like a routine every night. She'd throw it off the bed and she would say something to the effect of, that thing's nasty. Get it off our bed. And I would calmly and quietly go over, pick up my pillow, and restore it to its rightful place <laughs> and crawl back into bed there because it took her a while to realize, you love me, you're going to love my pillow. <laughs> I'm sure many of you have something similar in your home. Like every family knows what I'm talking about. There's an old blanket or a ratty pillow or a teddy bear or a stuffed animal or something, and the nature of the love that you have for that object is what makes it so very valuable. So there's a, a love, you understand, that seeks value in what is love. It, it looks for what's beautiful or lovely or expensive. It has status or brilliance. It's successful or dazzling. But then there's a love that creates value in what's loved. There's a philosopher, a Christian thinker, Nick Wasserstoff. He calls this bestowed worth. And it's a worth that's not earned. It comes as a gift. It comes about because of this value-creating love. And this gang is how God loves us. This is the kind of love that God loves us with, a value-creating love, bestowed worth, which brings us to the problem that we have. There's a great problem for our being loved, and that is that deep down inside where we don't talk about much, where society doesn't you know, push us to think about much, we know there's a lot about us. There's a lot about me and there's a lot about you that's not lovable. We're pretty dirty and ragged ourselves. And we kind of let ourselves off the hook with this because we live in such a therapeutic age. You know, so our culture just says, oh, you know, just tell yourself you're wonderful, you're awesome, you be you, don't ever change, you know. But the Bible doesn't approach human worth in that way. And it's really, really frank about our, our great worth and our great problem. And the great problem is that all of us are flawed and wounded and broken. Like ever since sin entered the world through what's called the fall, every member of the human race has this propensity to really mess things up. We each make our own deposits into the broken and fallen account of the human race. 
We choose to deceive when the truth just begs to be spoken. We grumble when a little gratitude is called for. We deliberately betray when we're bound by oaths of loyalty. We're ridiculously selfish and self-centered. And this brokenness, it permeates our whole being, you understand, our words and our thoughts and our actions are never free from it. And all of us are in the same boat here. And again, it's worse, much, much worse than we make it out to be. We let ourselves off the hook. But your sin, my sin, our sin, our darkness, our propensity to mess things up, our ego, our selfishness, it's way worse than we can imagine. I mean, that's the problem, and that's the bad news. The good news is God loves us more than we could possibly imagine anyway with a value-creating love. You and I, we are God's broken, busted-up, sin-tainted creatures. Do you understand? He knows all about our brokenness, and He loves us anyway. Our brokenness is no longer the most important thing about us. We belong to God. Brokenness is not our identity. Brokenness is not our destiny. We may be unlovely, but we're not unloved. You and I, we are so valuable, and it has nothing to do with us. It's just that God loves us. You see, love's why God created us in the first place. Theologians, they speak of the fact that God created everything freely, not out of necessity. And this is a really, really important idea because it means that God didn't make us because he was bored or lonely or had run out of things to do. God didn't create us out of need. He created us out of love. It was C.S. Lewis who wrote, God who needs nothing, loves into existence wholly superfluous creatures in order that he may love and perfect them. You see? But listen, CCC, the full extent of God's love was shown not so much when he chose to create us, it was actually shown when we have become sinful and unlovely, which brings us to Romans 5. Remember, I asked you to turn to Romans 5. The Bible puts it like this. When the Apostle Paul, he wrote, writes to the church at Rome in the fifth chapter when he says, while we were still weak, at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, God was fully aware of our condition. He knows that we are tainted and broken and sinful and fall so very sh far short. Every one of us has been damaged by sin and guilt that it would have seemed like the logical thing to do was to just discard the human race, to toss it out and just start all over. You know, we're not lovely enough or together enough. So let's just start the whole project over again. But God didn't do that. God proposed reconstructive surgery. He proposed to take the human race to where he could change our filth and remove the guilt and pay the, the price that sin demanded. And the place that he did that was on the cross through God's very own son, Jesus, sacrificing himself on the cross with his life, and that leaves the objects of his love, well, lovely. Normal human love might, like might, sometimes make sacrifices for a noble person, Paul says. But God has gone to the ultimate length to prove his love for us. He died for us at the right time, which was when we were sinful and weak. Lewis Meads, he put it this way, that it may be a very bad thing that I needed God to die for me, but it is a wonderful thing that God thinks I'm worth dying for. We may be broken, but we must never confuse brokenness with worthlessness. See, there's a love that seeks value in that which is loved, eros, the kind of love that's attracted to status and wealth and beauty. And we understand that love and we see it every day. It's mainly what all the love songs and the love stories and the movies and all are all about. But... There's a love that creates value in that which is loved. There's a love that takes busted up creatures like you and like me and just loves us beyond our reason. And the biblical writers, they didn't want to use the word eros to describe that kind of love. So they chose a fairly 
obscure, benign word that hadn't been used much up until that point, and it was the word agape. You may have heard of that word before, agape. It hadn't been used much by the Greeks at the time, but then it became filled with new meaning. It was used to describe this kind of love that could fill a busted up kind of human being, tainted with sin. It could fill them with value, bestowed worth, see. The Bible says in the book of 1 John, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called the children of God and that is what we are. Beloved, we are God's children now. CCC, I don't want you to miss this. This is like the opportunity of a lifetime, you understand? Your worth rests not on you. Your worth rests on the fact that you're a beloved child of the Most High God. At least you can be for anybody who wants it, for anybody who wants to step into it. See, everybody's a creation of God, but not everyone's a child of God, you know, fully a part of his family, adopted by the high king of heaven. But you can be. You can step into this love, this transformative love. Is this love that we're talking about here today, is it at the core of who you are? Like, is this your primary identity, the the love of God, that you're a beloved child of the high king of heaven? You know, the apostle Paul, he prayed one of the most fervent prayers in the entire Bible to the church at Ephesus. It's a prayer that ought to be close to us. So in the third chapter of Ephesians, beginning in verse 17, here's what he prayed. Here's what he wrote. Here's what he said. I pray that Jesus Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love, and may you have the power to grasp, as God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love really is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's so great that you'll never fully understand it. Then you'll be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now, that word grasp, if we go back to the slide before here, that word grasp that's there, may you have power to grasp. And the ancient Greek, what the New Testament was originally written in, that Greek word there for grasp is katalambano. And the word literally means to apprehend. Not, not just to like understand head knowledge, like, okay, God loves me but to really apprehend it, to capture it. And the word comes from the root word for rust, meaning to eat all the way through. And you see what Paul is saying here. My prayer, he says, is that you would let the high, wide, deep love of God, the agape love of God, the value-creating love of God, eat all the way through you, that you would really grasp onto what it means to be loved with an unfailing love, that you would really, really, really know that. And I know there are all kinds of people, even in this room here today, that say, yeah, 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 Dave, I got it. We're in church on Sunday, and you're telling me God loves me. Woohoo! You know, tell me something I don't know. But they never, ever really grasp how high and deep and long and wide the love of God is for them. It's not at the core of who they are. I'm talking about people who've been going to church for a long, long time, for years and years and years. Maybe they show up here, and they kind of do the religious thing, and they sing a few songs, and they maybe digest a few Bible verses, but they never, ever really grasp the love of God for them, and they really never get to know God. They go through life performing, looking for acceptance and security and significance in all the wrong places and all the wrong ways. And what happens is they end up making a mess of their world when they don't get those things. You know, we try to perform. We try to prove to God that we are worthy of his love in some sort of way. We're trying to earn his love and acceptance. That's not how it works. That's why Paul prayed this prayer. He says, the steadiness you need, the foundation you need, the core you need, it's not found in other people, he says. I pray that you'd be able to grasp the depth of the love of God for you. That is where it's at. Have you let... The unfailing love of God just capture your heart. Have you let it eat all the way through you? Because when you do, it'll just stabilize you like nothing else in this world. Like people might reject you. People betray you. You get some bad news. 
You don't get the recognition you think you deserve. Maybe you fail at something that you were striving for. Something doesn't come through for you that you were really hoping for. God's love for you, when it eats all the way through you, when you really grasp it, it can fill you with life and power to handle anything. That's the promise at the end of Paul's prayer there. Did you catch that? May you experience the love of Christ. Then you will be filled with the fullness of life and power that comes from God. See, there's a love that seeks value. It's just looking for somebody who's smart or rich or successful, maybe has it all together. But then there's a love that creates value, and it's available to you. Have you let that love eat all the way through you? Now, you may be saying, Dave, how exactly do I do that? Like, where do I start? Well, a beginning point is that we got to stay close to the cross. We got to look at the cross. We got to stay near the cross. It's something we do every week. We look at the cross. And this confronts, the cross confronts how we see ourselves. So typically, there are like two kinds of people. I, have, I imagine there are like two kinds of people in this room right now. Some of us in here, we have such an elevated view of ourselves where it's all about us. We don't say it like that, but it really is. And what's going on, what we think, we think, well, you know, Dave, I'm not perfect and all. I mean, I got some flaws and all, but, you know, I bring a lot to the table. I mean, I'm not that bad. I'm like in the 90th percentile, you know? I mean, there are all, all kinds of other people way worse than me, you know? God really is getting a pretty good deal when it comes to me. And there are a lot of people in here that think that. That's what you think. And we've got to look at the cross because the cross tells us this is the price that had to be paid, not for someone else's sin out there, but for your sin and my sin, you see? This is the price that sin demanded, a just God demanded, and he chose to take your place, to take your hit there, you see? You got to look to the cross. Now, there's another kind of person in this room here as well, and those are people who really don't think they bring anything to the table. You really believe you're worthless in a lot of ways. You know you're not great. You, know, you, you struggle just with any sort of worth at all. And we got to look to the cross too. You got to stay close to the cross too. Because I think if we just stay in that place where we just think we're worthless and we don't bring anything to the table, and why, I'm not worthy of any of this, well, we miss that the high king of heaven, the son of God, God himself, he took your place. He chose you. He died for you. Do you realize he willingly gave himself up for you, out of love for you? We got to look to the cross. I want to leave us with this here. It's a quote from C.S. Lewis, and then we're going to celebrate communion here in just a second. And in just a minute, you'll be able to, if you didn't, get one of those individually wrapped communion packets that remind us that Jesus gave himself up for us, his body given for us on the cross, his blood spilled for us so that we could know and be connected to the love of God. But here's this quote from C.S. Lewis, and then we'll celebrate communion together. It's from a book he wrote in 1941 called The Weight of Glory. He writes this. I read in a periodical the other day that the fundamental thing is how we think of God. By God himself, it is not. How God thinks of us is not only more important, but infinitely more important. Indeed, how we think of him is of no importance except insofar as it is related to how he thinks of us. It is written that we shall stand before him, shall appear, shall be inspected. The promise of glory is the promise, almost incredible, and only possible by the work of of Christ, that some of us, that any of us who really chooses shall actually survive that examination, shall find approval, shall please God. To please God, to be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work or a father and a son, it seems impossible. A weight or burden of glory 
which our thoughts can hardly sustain. But so it is. But so it is, CCC. Let's celebrate communion together. Let's look to the cross. Let's look to the great value-creating, bestowed worth that is given to us because of the love of Jesus Christ. And then we'll sing together. Next week, take care, everybody.